We'll be going over IRS Form 2555, Foreign Earned Income. So this is a tax form that individual taxpayers living overseas uh, can use as an attachment to their income tax return, either Form 1040 or 1040SR, uh, specifically to exclude uh, income uh, based on foreign so sources. So there's three types of exclusions or deductions at hand. Uh, there's the foreign earned income exclusion. There's the foreign housing allowance exclusion. And then there's also a deduction for the foreign uh, housing costs. So this tax form is it consists of nine parts. And we're going to, uh, most taxpayers won't need to complete each of these parts. But we're going to go through this in our hypothetical situation, we're going to go through all nine parts. So again, not everyone has to complete uh, nine parts, but we're going to walk through each of them step by step. So let's go ahead and start at the top. Uh, our hero, John Doe, he's got his taxpayer information right here. Uh, so in this case, he's a U.S. Uh, citizen living in Hong Kong, China as an engineer. And he's working for Acme Engineering Solutions based out of New York. Uh, this is their foreign address, uh, their Hong Kong address. Uh, they are a U.S. company, uh, but you can see you know, self-employment, foreign entity, a foreign affiliate. Uh, so uh, you can check the item in line five as appropriate. In line 6A, uh, if you previously filed this or the uh, Form 2555-EZ, then you would enter the year that you last filed the form. So in this case, that would be 2022. Uh, this is the 2023 version of the form. In 6B, if you did not previously file, uh, then you would check here and go directly to line 7. Otherwise, uh, you need to answer the questions in line 6C and 6D. So if you ever revoked a foreign exclusion, then you would need to enter that here, and then you would have, or you would have to say yes, and then you would enter the type of exclusion in the tax year uh, for which that re revocation was effective. So in this case, John Doe didn't. Uh, so... Uh, of what country are you a citizen slash national? So basically, uh, John Doe is a United States citizen. Uh, so that's his citizenship. He just happens to be living in, in China. In line 8A, uh, they ask a question about whether or not you maintained a separate foreign residence for your family. Uh, because of adverse living conditions. So uh, under certain circumstances, uh, a taxpayer may be stationed overseas, but because the living conditions aren't appropriate, they would have to uh, keep their family stateside. This happens a lot, obviously, in the military, but then also a lot of other non-military type of occupations. And there is a provision that allows taxpayers to uh, deduct expenses from income related to a second household. Uh, so uh, this might be a second foreign household where maybe uh, instead of living in China, uh, John Doe has his family, you know, in in the Philippines or some other place that's. Uh, not co-located with them. If you answered yes to that question, you would enter the the city and the country and then the number of days during the tax year that uh, you had that second household. Uh, you would also list your tax homes during your tax year and the dates established. So in this case, he just has his tax home in Hong Kong, China. That's his tax home for the year. Uh, and from here, uh, basically... Uh, once you complete the general information, you now either go to part two or part three, uh, depending on which residence test you're trying to qualify for. So you can qualify under what's known as the bona fide residence test. And we'll walk through that in part two.
or you can uh, you can qualify under what's known as the physical presence test, which is in part three. So pick one, and don't worry if you don't qualify under one test, you can just use the other test and see if you qualify. So the physical te presence test is a little bit more clear cut. You're literally counting days that you spent in country. Uh, in the bona fide residence test, you basically answer certain questions to make sure that you're not beholden to a different country before you can kind of say that you're a bona fide resident of the country uh, where you're located. So in line two, 10, you would enter the date that this residence began. So for John Doe, let's just say that he moved there in January 2022. And if you continue to live there, then you the instructions tell you to write continuing. Uh, so in line 11, you'll indicate which type of living quarters. So in this case, he's got a rented apartment in Hong Kong. Uh, did any of your family live with you? We'll indicate no. We'll just pretend that in this, in this situation, John Doe doesn't have any family members to speak of. So he's, he, he doesn't have anyone living with him abroad. If he did, then you would write yes, and then which members of your family and for what period of time. Uh, lines 13A and 13B are pretty important uh, because if you, well, if you uh, are telling the foreign country where you reside that you're not subject to their tax laws, then you have to be subject to the United States tax laws. So in this case, 13A asks, have you submitted a statement to the authorities of the foreign country that you're not a resident? So in this case, uh, we're going to answer no. And then we're going to say, are you required to pay income tax to the country where you claim a bona fide residence? And we'll say yes to this one. So, uh, you know, if this were vice versa, if we said we don't owe the foreign country taxes, uh, but, you know, so this, it would look like this. If we did that, then the United States government would say, well, uh, part of the foreign earned income exclusion is, you know, the fact that we're letting you exclude income based on the fact that, you know, you're beholden to another country. Uh, so uh, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. Uh, and so in this case, John Doe, he has not submitted that statement and he's paying taxes, reporting his income and paying taxes as appropriate to China. Uh, so in line 14, if you were president in the United States or any territories during the tax year, then you would uh, complete columns A through D for each visit that you went to the United States. So, you know, in this case, John Doe uh, entered... February 1st, 2023, and then he left. He didn't spend any time on business and he didn't earn any income in the United States. So you can put this up to eight times. Uh, if you were present and you did earn income, then you would not include this on your income figures down below. Um, in line 15A, we're going to list any contractual terms or conditions that uh, have to do with your employment. Uh, this is all kind of employment related questions. So uh, what type of visa did you enter under? Did the visa limit your length of stay? In this case, we said no. But if yes, then you would attach an explanation. Uh, if you did maintain a tax home in the United States while living abroad, uh, then that's kind of another sign that you may you know, may not be uh, passing the bona fide uh, residence test under certain circumstances. But if you did answer yes, then you would enter the address of your home, whether or not it was rented, uh, your occupants, and your relationship uh, with them. So all of this is in our form instructions, by the way, right here. So I'm just going to take a quick look under the line 15 specifics here. Oh, there is nothing in here. So um, we do... Uh, break this down a little bit more uh, in our article to include the requirements for passing both the bona fide residence test and the physical presence test. Uh, so you can find that in our article. Uh, if you go to teachmepersonalfinance.com, type in IRS form 2555 
you'll see the article up here. In part three, we're going to discuss the physical presence test. This literally is a count of uh, any 330 days that you were on the ground out of a 365 day or a 12 month period. So in this case, I mean, we could have put January 1st, we'll do that. So in this case, January 1st through uh, December 31st, uh, his primary country is China. Uh, we should include the US for that one visit that he had in uh, February. So the IRS does have rules if, uh, based on partial time in country, uh, partial time in the United States, so on and so forth. So so again, just, uh, just as before, if you, uh, if you have income here in column F, you would not include it in part four under this, but you would include it on your Form 1040 or your 1040SR. So um, in this case, we're just documenting the one trip that they made to the United States back in February. Uh, if you had no travel, you would simply enter physically present in a foreign country or countries for the entire 12 month period. So assuming that you pass either the bona fide residence test or the physical presence test, we're now going to go into the foreign earned income calculation. So on lines 19 through 23, you're going to be entering only income, income to include non-cash income that you earned and actually or constructively received during the tax year for the services that you performed in that country. So uh, let's break down a little bit about the difference between actual and constructive receipt. So constructive receipt uh, is uh, that you had the right to an uh, item of income, uh, whether or not you actually received it. So the most common example would be the difference between your last payday of a period uh, of a tax year. Let's say you had a thousand dollar bonus that was actually given to you on December 29th, then you can say that that was actually received on December 29th of the given tax year. But if you received a check for that uh, and you did not cash that check or deposit that check until January January 2nd, then that's known as constructive receipt. Uh, technically, you uh, received that in 2023 uh, instead of 2024, even if you chose not to cash that check. So uh, if you're a cash basis taxpayer, you're going to report all income that you received in the tax year, regardless of whether or not you earned the service or if it was advanced payment for a service that you uh, performed the following year. Uh, so you won't include any income from line 14 or line 18. So this is the line 18, and then this is the line 14. So um, again, Either of those items where you earn some money in the United States, you would not put that here in part four. So in this situation, we have line 19. Uh, he's earned $100,000 in foreign income. None of this was any kind of a allowable share for personal services. Uh, he does have some non-cash income. He had $110,000 of lodging. He also had $4,000 of meals. You know, we could put car expenses or other property. We're just keeping it simple here. So this is what he earned. Uh, on this side, we can also add up any allowances, reimbursements, paid expenses for cost of living differential, uh, family expenses, education, you know, any kind of these stipends. If there's a different type of stipend, you would, you know, list the type of you know, stipend or allowance, and then how much he received. And then line 22G, we're going to total everything up and put it right here. For the this example, we don't have any of those allowances, so we'll just skip over that. We also don't have any other foreign earned income, but if you did, we would list that here. 
So when we total everything out, we have $214,000 of income. And uh, line 25 talks about meals and lodging included here that is excludable. So I put in the cost of meals. Uh, there's uh, some criteria about you know how to determine whether or not that's excludable. Specifically, if the meals and lodging were provided for your employer's convenience and on premises. So, and you have to have, if you are putting lodging in that, then you have to have been required to accept the lodging as part of your employment. So, uh, basically, this scenario, he's living in an apartment off site, but all of his meals are provided on site. So that's that's kind of a, you know. You know, you can do that. That would be an example of how you would do that. Um, the most likely scenario might be something like uh, breakfast and lunch are provided on site, but then dinner is his responsibility, in which case you would uh, do two thirds of the allowance as an excludable item. And then uh, and then you total everything out. We get out two hundred and ten thousand dollars. This is the foreign earned income. So you're going to put this here. And then we're going to carry this number down to part five. So everyone completes part five, enters the number from line 26 to line 27. And then you go to one of two places. If you're looking to claim the housing exclusion and or the deduction, you'll go to part six. If you're skipping that, you go to part seven, where you're going to calculate the foreign earned income exclusion. So let's go to part six, where we talk about the uh, housing exclusion and or deduction. So qualified housing expenses, the IRS has pretty clear defining criteria. You can find that in the instructions or in our article. Uh, there is, uh, so in the instructions, uh, there is a base table of how much housing expenses are or the, the housing exclusion would be. Uh, However, there are, is also a list of high cost of living localities uh, worldwide. So that's in the back of the IRS Form 2555 instructions. So, for example, uh, Hong Kong, China uh, happens to be 114,300 uh, compared to the uh, generic uh, housing allowance amount or exclusion amount which I think is $36,000. So that's 30, that represents 30% of the uh, foreign, uh, foreign earned income exclusion. So uh, if we weren't living in Hong Kong, China, we would be putting that $36,000 here. However, uh, what you technically do is um, you use that, and then we, we're going to take the smaller of either that allowance or the 110 so the smaller the allowance or the actual expenses. So in this case, the actual expenses, now we're going to see the number of days in your qualifying period that fall within the tax year. Uh, in this case, it was 365 days. So we're gonna, so, but whatever number of days, you would multiply that by the figure in line 32. In this case, since we included all 365 days, we're simply going to enter 19,200. From there, we're going to subtract the line 32 number from line 30, and we arrive at 90,800. Employer provided amounts. So this includes quite a few things. Uh, basically, uh, wages and salaries received, uh, fair market value of compensation, rent paid by by your employer to your landlord or uh, housing expense reimbursement, education expenses, things of that nature. So I simply took his, you know, John Doe's, the rest of his salary, which was $100,000 of his wages. Uh, so now we're going to divide this line 34 by line 27. We round that decimal out to three places, so we get 0.476. And we're going to multiply that by the line 33 amount, and we come up with 43,238. So this is your uh, housing exclusion. Uh, 
it cannot be larger than this amount here, which it's not, so we're in good shape. So this is the amount of the housing exclusion. Now we're gonna see uh, what we do with the foreign earned income exclusion. So the maximum foreign earned income exclusion for 2023 anyway is $120,000. That's the number that's right here in line 37. So if we completed part six, uh, which we did, uh, then we're going to enter the number from line 31 uh, into line 38. So that was the 365 days. Everyone else, uh, you would enter the number of days in your qualifying period that fall within your tax year. So, um, and then you can, so in the instructions in line 31, uh, basically that's the period during which you meet your tax home test in either the bona fide residence or your physical presence test. Uh, so in this case, John Doe's been there the entire time. There's no exception. So we've got the 365 days here. So you divide that by the number of days in your tax year, we get a 1.00, and we're going to multiply this amount by the, or the 120 by the one, and we get $120,000. Uh, we're gonna find our remaining exclusion amount by subtracting the line 36 number from the line 27 number, that's how much of our income we still have left that we may be able to exclude. So the $166,762, we're gonna take the smaller, uh, so that's the housing exclusion. That's gonna be the amount that we can actually, or sorry, the foreign earned income exclusion. So in part eight, we're going to add lines 36 and 42, that's the housing exclusion and the foreign earned income exclusion. Uh, now there are certain deductions that were allowed in calculating adjusted gross income that, that are allocated to the excluded income. Uh, in this case, we don't have any, but we do break out examples. Um, a lot of them are from schedule one. Uh, basically the, uh, the deductions uh, to arrive at AGI uh, so some of those need to be backed out uh, if they are allocated to the excluded income. So in this case, we don't have any of those, but you would back those out so that you get a new number to put onto line 8D of Schedule 1. Again, you're not losing any of these. You're simply shifting that from where it should have been or where it was before to another line on Schedule 1. Uh, if there's an amount on this line, you also would need to complete the foreign earned income tax worksheet, which is in the form 1040 instructions. So we've got a copy of that in our show notes and kind of walk you through that. In part nine, uh, this is a portion, uh, this is a part that uh, uh, impacts taxpayers claiming the housing deduction and only if line 33 is more than line 36, and if line uh, 27 is more than line 43. So in this case, both of those instances are true. So the difference here, uh, so to kind of conceptualize, we're gonna subtract uh, this amount from this 90,800, and we get the 47,562. The line 43 amount is this total amount of ex, uh, exclusion from the original income total. So we get that. We're going to enter the smaller, which happens to be the 46762 And then let's imagine that we had a $10,000 housing deduction carryover from the prior year. We're going to add those two lines here and on Schedule 1. Uh, so if these numbers are larger, or if for some reason the exclusion amount is larger than line 27, uh, if uh, line 36 is more than line 33, then you would not be completing this part. So, and, and again, each of these figures that you uh, calculate, 
they're going to go on schedule one of your tax return because we're excluding that or we're claiming a, an above the line deduction on your tax return. And then from schedule one, that flows down to your 1040. So uh, even though this is only a three page tax form, it can be involved, it can be complex. And uh, we do our best to address everything in the instructions as much as we can. But if there are specific questions, uh, please feel free to hit us up in the comments. So we did men mention some uh, uh, forms and schedules in, in this video. So we'll put links to articles and videos that we've created about those uh, in, in our show notes. So if you like our articles, please subscribe to our newsletter. If you like our YouTube videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or comments, or if there's another topic that you'd like to see in an upcoming video, please hit me up in the comment section. Thank you very much and have a great day.